What's up, people? My name is James Blissett, professional gambler, founder of Lucrative MMA, you know all that stuff. I'm going to be speaking about Cyril Garn versus John Jones, UFC 285 main event matchup. Absolute banger of a matchup. But, sneaky suspicion, the fight might not be as much of a banger as we hope. Could get a little bit boring in there from time to time. We'll see. I'll explain my thoughts on the fight. I'll break down the stylistics of the fight. And then, as always, I will see if we can get any value on any of the betting lines this weekend on this heavyweight title fight. We've been smashing it in 2023 so far. If you want my official picks and predictions and official bets for the upcoming card and for all the upcoming cards in the future, you can go to lucrativemmabetting.com. All the links and all the links and bio and all of that stuff is in the description below. So yeah, we'll get straight into the the breakdown. It's a um, it's a good matchup, man. The return of John Bones Jones, one of the greatest fighters of all time, probably my greatest fighter of all time. You know, you get scolded for your opinion out there these days, but I don't really give a shit. In my opinion, he's the greatest fighter of all time just because, in my opinion, he's the most well-rounded fighter of all time. Yes, I think he's more well-rounded than GSP. Just in terms of his skill set at the higher levels, right? Obviously, he did fight a lot of people who were quote-unquote past their prime, but he beat two generations. So he did beat the past their prime guys. He's talking about the Rashads. The Leo O Machidas, you know, people like that. But then he also destroyed Cormier and Gustafson and, and that era. And then they actually started to destroy another era with the likes of Dominic Reyes. And I guess, you know, Tiago Santos was kind of there at the time. So, yeah, he's a great fighter, man. Probably the greatest of all time. It's hard to say that just because of his troubles with PEDs. You know, so you always have to think, does that take away from his GOAT status? Probably. Uh, is he completely removed from the conversation? Probably. You know, it, it's just tough to say. But in terms of skill set, well-roundedness, um, finishing ability, I mean, everything. Cardio, you know, whatever you want to say. I, I think John's probably the greatest of all time, if not, you know, top five. Um, easily, top three easily, you know. And greatest of all time is just a hard thing to say. I think it's more errors, right? But John Jones, nevertheless, John Jones is a great fighter. He's got a great, well-rounded skill set. We'll speak about John first before we get on to Cyril. John has amazing elbows. Really love his elbows. He has amazing striking in general. I mean, he can throw any strike in the book. John Jones creates strikes. You know, strikes we haven't really seen in MMA before. John Jones creates them. John Jones is like the first guy I remember throwing those upwards elbows. Just elbows from the clinch, random angles. And Cyril Garn actually has thrown those a lot of times in the UFC now. But yeah, he's a very dynamic striker, John. He's going to throw all types of strikes at you. He really loves that oblique kick. That's one of his favorite strikes. That's how he sets up distance a lot of times. He'll throw the oblique kick on the inside with his knee turned out. He'll also throw the oblique kick on the outside with his knee turned in. And he'll also throw the oblique kick straight, kind of like a teep, just straight forward. So when he throws a strike, he can throw the strike from multiple different angles in multiple different angles. That's when you know you've got a really, really diverse striker, when they can throw a strike from and in different angles. John's definitely that type of fighter. When we talk about his wrestling, it's very, very good. Talk about his jiu-jitsu, very, very good. You know, he's got some dynamic finishes on the ground. Heavy, heavy elbows. I remember he pounded away at Gustafsson in their rematch. Very dominant. Even the way he um, finished DC, very, very dominant from top position with those strikes he was landing. He obviously submitted Lyoto Machida from a standing guillotine, which we don't see too often in MMA. You know, you have to be a strong man to pull that off. We don't see that too often in in men's MMA or women's MMA, really. So he's a well-rounded fighter. He's a well-rounded guy, right? There's nothing you can point at and go, he's bad at that. His cardio is amazing. Probably one of the best cardios I've ever seen in MMA history. His cardio is, is absolutely unbelievable. And on the other hand, we've got Cyril Garn, right? Cyril Garn is quite similar to John Jones in the striking in terms of he can throw any strike at any time. Cyril Garn loves to spin. 
And for a 260 odd pound man to spin, it's very impressive. And the way he does it is very impressive. It's not just a, a regular spinning back kick. He throws his spinning back kicks, punches, elbows, heel kicks with pinpoint accuracy. I remember that spinning wheel kick, spinning heel kick, he landed on Francis Ngannou. I mean, that was so accurate. It was heel straight to the head, you know, heel to the temple. He kind of skimmed off Francis' head, so it didn't really damage him too much. But even in the title of us, a fight, a few spinning back kicks to the body, really, really tough. And he ended up basically finishing that fight because of body shots. It was the face shot that ended up finishing him, but it was the body shot that just wore him down, kind of like a Stipe versus Cormier type fight, right? It was the face shots that ended it, but it was really the body shots that started off. Same thing in the Garn versus two of us fight. So Garn will throw his strikes to the body, to the head, and most certainly to the leg. You know, you go back to that Cyril Garn fight, and every single fight he's ever fought. Um, sorry, the Francis and Garnu fight, and, and every other fight Garn's fought. You know, he peppers away at those legs. He really, really invests in the legs, in the body, and then he throws short, sharp strikes to the head most of the time. So both of these fights are very well rounded on the feet. Now, when you speak about Garn's grappling and his jiu-jitsu, he leaves a lot to be desired. He obviously got grapple fucked by Francis Ngannou, who is a primarily striker. Francis Ngannou had never shown any wrestling prowess in his previous 19 MMA fights before then. I think it was. But he did show it in the Cyril Garn fight. He dominated Cyril Garn in the grappling, took him down multiple times, and won him the fight that way. So... That's the only time we've really seen Cyril taken down and or dominated in any type of grappling scenario, even on the feet, even in jiu-jitsu, even from bottom anything, right? So that was definitely an alarming thing to see for a Cyril Garn fan, Cyril Garn gambler, as I was against his, uh, when he fought in that Francis Ngannou fight. It's an alarming thing to see because you know that there's still major holes in his game when it comes to the wrestling. Jiu-jitsu looks okay. Um... IQ in the jiu-jitsu looks pretty bad in my opinion. When you go back to the Francis Ngannou fight, he twice got taken down because he abandoned traditional takedown defense, dropping his weight, trying to frame off and get the underhooks. He abandoned traditional takedown defense for a Kimura defense. It didn't work the first time he tried it against Francis Ngannou because Ngannou just got the double leg. As soon as Cyril went for the Kimura, Ngannou got the double leg, took him down. So that Kimura attempt basically got him taken down, right? Because he was defending the takedown before that. He then tried the Kimura takedown defense again in the next round or the round after that. And he got taken down again. So in my opinion, bad I fight IQ, even if it wasn't bad fight IQ to try it the first time, most certainly the second time, because kind of proven that Francis Ngannou was too strong for the Kimura. Because he actually did get the Kimura when he got taken down the first time. He got the Kimura... But then what happened was, Francis was so strong, he just powered out of the Kimura. So at that point, Cyril should really realize that, all right, this guy's, I'm not really going to Kimura, Kimura this guy. He's a very strong guy. He's a hard guy to Kimura anyway at the best of times. And now it's round four and I'm tired, right? So in my opinion, not only questionable grappling, but also questionable IQ in the grappling, which is encapsulated in the questionable grappling in general he just hasn't spent that much time on the mat as we know Cyril Garn is a kickboxer coming from a kickboxing slash Muay Thai background so he just hasn't spent that much time on the mat and even in the on the MMA mats to understand positioning and also understand when and when not to go for things and that showed in that Francis and Garnu fight he also got taken down multiple times uh, other than those two attempts that I spoke of and they got taken down once more I believe and yeah, his just whole grappling game didn't look that good there. Now, he will get takedowns of his own. You know, he's shown that in multiple UFC fights. He even showed that against Francis Ngannou. He shot a few takedowns in that fight, but he definitely got one in the last round. He was on top. He was on his way to winning that fight. If he would have stayed on top, Francis Ngannou, which I feel like was possible. Francis wasn't offering that much from his back. Then Cyril Garn would have won the fight. But Cyril Garn decided to go for a leg lock in the fifth round. Now, I know that there's been a lot of controversy around if he went for a leg lock or if he just got swept. I'm of the opinion that he clearly went for a leg lock. I don't think it's really debatable. Um, maybe got swept after he went for the leg lock, but whatever, he's gone for the leg lock, right? So he's abandoned position. So Cyril Garn abandoned position, top position, 
with two minutes left in a 25 minute fight and he didn't get the leg lock. It was a very low percentage move in MMA, um, modern day MMA. He didn't get the leg lock and so he got reversed and Francis and Garner ended up winning the fight because of that moment. So again, showing questionable grappling. So I've touched on their striking, their grappling, their cardio, you know, and I really wanted to highlight the main difference in this fight when you talk about their skill sets. Because what we do first, when I'm breaking down fights, and this is something where you can look into the philosophy behind the way I cap fights, I'll look at both fighters' stylistics, right? So I'll look at their grappling, how they match up, who's a southpaw, who's an orthodox, who has a longer reach, who throws these type of strikes, who's better at jiu-jitsu, who initiates jiu-jitsu, all of this stuff, right? The stylistics of the fighters, I'll look at that. Then I look at the intangibles. So I shouldn't have really said reach and height before. So then I'll look at the intangibles, which is, or I'll say the statistics, right? Which is the height, the reach, how much volume they throw at each fight, how many significant strikes they land, what is their takedown defense percentage, takedown accuracy, that sort of stuff. And then I'll look at the intangibles. So what I say by intangibles, how I cap intangibles, everyone's different, is cardio, potential ring rust, if they fought stylistic matchups like this before. You know, things that don't come straight to the eye when you're looking at the fight. So that's how I cap fights. It's a, it's a free phased approach. It's the stylistics, it's the statistics, and then it's the intangibles. So with the stylistics, the glaring hole and the glaring difference between both fighters is the grappling and the cardio, uh, sorry, the grappling, uh, the wrestling, the MMA grappling. On the Garn side, it's lacking, whereas on the John side, it's not lacking. And then we'll so we speak about the statistics, and this is a very quick one to speak about. Cyril Garn is a volume kickboxer. So he will pump out a lot of volume, right? He does shoot takedowns, but he only shoots takedowns when he's not comfortable on the feet or or when he's dominating so much that he just he's just playing around at this point. He can easily shoot a takedown, right? I mean, he also will mix it up, but I've seen many fights where he's just happy to, like the Rosenstroke fight. He shot two takedowns, but for the most part, he was happy to stay on the outside, bouncing, bouncing, because he was clearly winning on the feet, right? So he will mix it up. You know, thinking about it, he will mix it up, but he mainly likes to stay on the feet. On the other hand, John Jones, he is a lot smarter with his takedowns, in my opinion. He will shoot takedowns if he needs to, right? So, for example, if you look at a Cyril Garn versus Francis Ngannou fight, Cyril Garn shot a takedown in round five, and that could have won him the fight if he didn't give up position. He should have been shooting takedowns in round four, in my opinion, but he didn't do that. That was because Francis was pushing the action. If that was John Jones in there, in my opinion, fight IQ would have been like, all right, I'm getting taken down. Let me try and take him down first, right? So John Jones, he recognizes things in the octagon a little bit better, and then he will shoot his takedown. So when we're talking st statistically, John Jones doesn't really have a good takedown accuracy. He's only got 44% takedown accuracy, which is not good. So talking about statistics, 44% takedown accuracy for John Jones. But a little bit of that is skewed by the Dominic Reyes fight. But in general, he's not a great wrestler, but he will get takedowns. On the other hand, the statistics, John Jones is moving up in weight. This is a massive thing. This is also because the uh, the intangibles, but just in terms of the weight. John Jones moving up in weight here. And Cyril Garn is a natural heavyweight. John Jones is not a natural heavyweight. Maybe he is now, but when we talk about natural, you can't make yourself into a natural something. I mean, it takes a long, long time. If John Jones had, you know, minimal body fat, he wouldn't be a heavyweight or he'd be a light, a light heavyweight, not a light heavyweight, but a light heavyweight. You know, at this point in his career, he's probably put on some solid muscle. So if he trimmed down his body fat, he'd probably only be about two, 210, two, uh, 220 maybe, you know? So whereas Cyril Garn, you know, same, same body fat percentage as John, he'd probably be 240, right? So you're talking a, a big, big difference in terms of the stature of these two guys at least in terms of the weight. Now, John actually has an 85 inch reach, which is a longer reach than Cyril Garn. So although Cyril Garn has more weight on him, he's a bigger man, John's actually gonna have a reach advantage. 
So it's very interesting when you speak about the statistics. And now the intangibles, which in my opinion, this is where the fight is based on. So obviously the big glaring difference in the stylistics, as we mentioned, is the wrestling and the grappling. And I do think the fight is going to be won and lost there to some degree. But I think the intangibles are the main thing that is standing out to me in this fight. So the intangibles being that John Jones has been out of the octagon for three years. He is coming back to the octagon after three years away after one of his worst performances in the octagon. His last performance was against Dominic Reyes. A lot of people say Dominic Reyes won that fight. A lot of people say John Jones won that fight. It was basically a 50-50 fight where John clearly lost two rounds, if any, right? I mean, if not more. So a lot of people say that that was one of John Jones, if not John Jones' worst performance ever in the UFC octagon. That was three years ago. And he didn't fight after that. He's coming back now, but he's not coming back to that weight class. He's coming back up a weight class. So he's moving from light heavyweight to heavyweight. And a thing to note here is that light heavyweight to heavyweight is a massive, massive jump. That is a 60 pound maximum jump. So light heavyweight, you have to weigh in at 205 pounds. Heavyweight, you can weigh in at 265 pounds. And that's a big, big jump. You know, he's obviously not going to weigh in 205 pounds and Cyril's not going to weigh 265. So there's not going to be a 60 pound difference between the guys. But I do expect there to be a healthy 10 to 15 pounds difference between Cyril Garn and John Jones. And even if there's not 10 to 15 pound difference... Cyril is going to have the natural weight advantage, not just because of the numbers of the weight is higher, so he's got an advantage on that side, but also because he has an advantage at that weight, meaning he's been carrying this weight his entire adult life. Cyril's always been a big dude, whereas John Jones has not always been a heavyweight. Cyril's always been a heavyweight. You know, when I say always, I'm not talking about when he was a kid, but you know, John Jones has basically been a light heavyweight his whole career. Cyril's been a heavyweight his whole career, right? So there's a big difference there. Cyril is used to carry around this weight where John Jones has only been carrying it around for the last two years or so. John Jones has been planning this move up to heavyweight for a couple of years, but Cyril's been a heavyweight for 10 years. So it's a massive, massive difference. So I don't know how John's going to hold up at heavyweight. Is his cardio going to be the same? If you go back and watch that Reyes fight, which I did in tape study for this matchup, John Jones's cardio was insane. It was absolutely unbelievable. I mean, that fifth round, he had his best round ever. You know, that pace that fight was fought at was crazy because Dominic set a really high pace. And John just walked forward for the last three rounds and put it on Dominic Reyes. Is he going to be able to do that with 30, 40 pounds more weight on him? I don't know, man. It's tough. I've gone through stages in my life where I've put on a lot of weight and let me tell you, it affected my movements. It affected me athletically. It affected me playing sports. It affected me in Thai boxing. It affected me in boxing. Uh, I definitely noticed it. So is John going to notice it? I'm, he definitely is. He's going to notice it. You can't put on that much weight and not notice it, even if it's good weight. At the end of the day, weight is weight, right? It is weight. You can put on 20 pounds of muscle, 20 pounds of fat, 10 pounds of muscle and 10 pounds of fat. Combined to make 20 pounds, it doesn't matter. You're not going to perform the exact same way you performed a light heavyweight. So there's a question mark on John's cardio here. He's carrying a lot more weight. We don't know how his cardio is going to be. We know how Cyril's cardio is going to be. Because he's fought many, many five-round fights before at this weight. So we know that. So that's a big intangible. The other intangible is he's been away from the sport for a long time. As I said, he had his worst performance in the UFC octagon, arguably, against Dominic Reyes. And now his next fight is going to be against the best heavyweight in the entire UFC division for the belt. He's not coming back and having a warm-up fight here. This is not Tatiana Suarez coming back after three years injuries and fighting Montella De La Rosa. This is not that. This is Tatiana Suarez coming back and fighting Wei Li Zhang or Valentina Shevchenko. You know, this is a massive, massive difference. So... How I see this fight breaking down is 
both fighters are going to be on the outside early. Both fighters are going to be establishing their range. If anybody takes center of the octagon, I think it's going to be John. But it really depends on tactics. So it's really hard to say in that regard. You know, Cyril may think, you know what? I'm going to put it on this guy. He's been out for three years. I'm a much bigger man. He's not used to fighting people this big in the octagon. Let me just put it on him. Let me dictate range, right? That, that might be the case. Or John might do what he does in a lot of his fights, just put the pressure and pace on him, right? So that's hard. It comes down to tactics. Um, but I will say that I believe probably John Jones is going to take the center of the octagon, if any. I think Cyril's going to be on the back foot, kicking, pouring out the jab. Cyril's got an amazing jab. He'll throw it at different angles. Like I said earlier in the breakdown, it's a real, real tell of a high quality striker, the way he can throw strikes from different and two different angles. So Cyril will throw the jab, not just straight ahead. He'll throw the jab. He'll um, put his head off center line as he throws the jab. He'll turn his body out. He'll throw the, like a little screw shot jab uppercut. So I think he's going to be pumping that out. I think he's going to be pumping the leg kicks out. I think he's going to do the teep kick. He has a beautiful teep kick, Cyril. You know, I could really speak about both of these guys uh, striking mechanics all day, you know, because I'm a striking nerd. I love striking. But I'm not going to do that. I think Cyril's going to be on the outside, you know, racking up points. And I think John's going to push the grappling and push the pace in this fight. John needs to make it an ugly fight, in my opinion. Cyril wants to make it a clean fight. If this is a clean fight, 25 minutes, I think Cyril runs away with it, 49-46. John needs to make this gritty, dirty. John needs to get on the inside. But if he does that, he's going to have a bigger man than he's ever faced before in the octagon, clinching him, pushing him up against the cage, knee him, kneeing him in the belly. He's got a good tie clinch. Um, Cyril, he's coming from the tie scene, got great knees up the middle. We saw that in the Nganu fight. And anytime he gets a clinch, you know, I can't remember who it was now. It might have been Dos Santos. So he had a really, really good clinch game. And he actually finished Dos Santos with an elbow um, from the clinch, break off elbow from the clinch. Um, so yeah, John's going to want to make it dirty. He's going to try and make it dirty. He's going to try and mix in the grappling. The big question, the alarming thing we spoke about earlier, is John going to be able to get Cyril da down on the ground? I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's hard for me to say. He wasn't able to get Dominic Reyes on the ground. Only two occasions he was able to do that. And he shot about eight takedowns. Cyril Gunn's a much bigger man. In my opinion, comparable takedown defense to Dominic Reyes. I don't think Dominic Reyes has this elite takedown defense that's more elite than Cyril Gunn. I don't believe that. And even if he does, I think it's offset by Cyril Gunn's weight advantage over Dominic Reyes and, in, and over John Jones. So, yes... John may be able to get him down to the ground, but I can't say with certainty that he's going to be able to do that or that he's not going to be able to do that. For me, it's kind of an unknown. If he does take him down, I do think Cyril can be in trouble because I don't think he'll be able to reach John's level in the jiu-jitsu when you're talking about the last two years or something, you know, since that Nganu fight. I don't really think his jiu-jitsu is going to come up that much. I don't think it's going to compare to John's jiu-jitsu. And even if it you know, even if he does improve his jiu-jitsu a lot, John's just so dominant on top, it won't really matter. And they're both big guys. Oftentimes you'll see when two big guys get on top of each other, it's hard for the guy to get up from bottom, even if he's a good jiu-jitsu practitioner. It's just hard for him to make space because the guys are just so big. They have so much weight crushing down on each other. You know, it's gravity. Think back to um, Chris Barnett versus Jake Collier. I mean, you can get him off him. You know, he basically sat on him. Ben Rothwell over... Chris Barnett. So I think a fight comes down to the wrestling and with John Jones. Because if, he, if he's able to have his way with the wrestling, he's going to win the fight, right? But Cyril Gunn will pop, pop back, up, back up to his feet. He doesn't really... He definitely tries to get back up to his feet, you know. In my mind, in that Francis Ngannou fight, he kind of just accepted bottom. But he didn't really. He, fifth round, he was just knackered. But he got up from underneath Ngannou about two or three times. I just don't know if he's going to be able to do it against someone like John. But I do think Francis Ngannou is an, an absolute athletic freak, you know. So if you're just comparing the Francis Ngannou fight to John Jones' wrestling, I don't think it's a 100% comparable fight because I know John Jones has better wrestling technique. He's a better wrestler outright than Francis Ngannou. But I don't think he's nowhere near as strong as him. I think Francis Ngannou is a lot stronger, just outright pure strength um, and talk on his athletic movements than John Jones. So Francis Ngannou was able to take Cyril Garn down fairly easily. He's just a massive, huge, humongous, 280 pound man in the octagon. 270 pound man in the octagon. So 
I think that's part of the reason why I was able to take him down and dominate him on the ground, you know, keep taking him down. I don't think it was because Cyril was a bad wrestler or a bad defensive wrestler, you know. So I think that's an important distinction to make. John might not just be able to go there and take him down just because Nganu did. Because I think that's a lot, a lot of people are saying that this week. And I think I'm predicting a lot of people to be at, to say that this week. Oh, Francis Nganu took him down. John's a much better wrestler than Nganu. John's going to get him down. I don't think it's completely comparable. Maybe John can get him down. But that doesn't change the fact that it's not a comparable fight to Nganu, in my opinion, right? So watch for people this week. So I think a lot of people will say to take, yeah, Francis took him down, so John can. But I don't really think it's as black and white, cut and dry as that, as usually nothing is in MMA. But like I said earlier, the big glaring difference in this fight is the intangibles. Yes, it's the rep wrestling and grappling of gone, but we've spoke on that. To me, the intangibles are a little bit more outstanding. They catch my eye a little bit more. The fact that John hasn't fought at this level in three years. The fact that John hasn't fought at this level at heavyweight ever. The fact that John hasn't fought at heavyweight ever. He's coming in against the best guy in the division. Now Francis Ngannou's gone. And I'm not sure if he's ready for that, man. Three years of ring rust, which is a real thing. And Francis Ngannou is a decent sized underdog. So for me, I'm a gambler. When I'm looking at the lines, I'll, I'm going to be taking a poke on Cyril Ghosn. Um I am playing in to the unknowns here. It's very similar to what I did. Actually, it's extremely similar to what I did with Aaron Blanchfield versus Jessica Andrade. I wasn't extremely confident Aaron Blanchford was going to be able to get the takedowns. And actually, I was proved to be right in that fact because it was very hard for her to get the takedowns, right? But she did manage to get it. And then when she got it, it was over, which I knew that was a high probability, right? But what I did in that fight, it was a plus 135 number, plus 140 number, just like Cyril Gahn is right now. And what I did, I played into the unknowns. I said, all right, maybe Jessica's going to be too physical to get taken down. But I don't really know. And it's only going to take one or two takedowns for Jessica to lose the fight. And Jessica's coming in on short notice. John's coming in on short notice. Not really, but John's coming in on heavyweight, a different division. Um, so, you know, I took the plunge on the dog and obviously it paid off there. There's a lot of parallels to that fight. Now, that doesn't mean anything in terms of who's going to win this fight. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying Aaron won, so John's... Uh, so Cyril's going to win. But what I am saying is there are a lot of parallels between my bet on Erin, why I bet on her, and funnily enough, the betting line is exactly the same, and why I'm betting on Cyril Garn this weekend. Because I'm playing into those unknowns. And in my opinion, at a plus 135 number, that's how you play this fight. You play into the unknowns, not laying minus 170 chalk, but by playing plus 135 underdog money, right? So I do think this fight could be close. I do think this fight will be close, actually. I'll actually say I think the fight is going to be close. And John, I, I, I'm going to say this as well about John. John has the X factor. John is one of the greatest fighters of all time. John has GOAT status. And I said this about Volkanovsky when he's fought Islam Makachev. And, you know, a few people laughed, but this is actually a real thing in MMA gambling. And again, speaking of my philosophy, this is a really important thing to understand in MMA. When you're speaking about the GOAT fighters, best fighters of all time, talking about Khabib, talking about um, um, John Jones, uh, GSP, you know, these type of fighters. Alexander Volkanovsky. When you're talking about these fighters, they have an X factor. They can pull stuff out that you haven't seen them pull out before. So you do have to be a little bit extra careful and you'd actually have to cap that in when you are betting on them. Right, nobody thought Volk would do what he did. Even I didn't thought he would, well, I didn't, I wasn't necessarily sure he would perform that well and I bet on him. But I kept in that he's one of the greatest fighters of all time and he could show us stuff that he hasn't shown us before and that's exactly what he did, right? And that's what Khabib's done many times. We didn't know Khabib had an absolute rock chin until he fought Gaethje. Um, absolute crazy pressure until he fought, you know, Gaethje, I mean, maybe not the pressure, but definitely the chin. Um, Volkanovski against Islam, right? So, the, so John could come out here and just, because he's great, one of the greatest fighters of all time, he just wins it on that fact. You know, even John in his Reyes fight, he was 2-0 down going into the third round. He had to win all three rounds and he won them. He won them. 
and the fifth round he dominated. That's because he's the greatest fighter of all time. So he has this X factor. He pulls things out of the bag. Um, so that is something you have to think about when you're backing against John Jones, right? But at the end of the day, I think plus 135 is a decent number. It's enough for me to bet it, so I'm betting it. So that's it, man. I'm going to outright pick um, Cyril Garn. I'm going to say Cyril Garn wins a close decision. Maybe there's some controversy there, um, but I think he takes a 48-47 uh, decision, 49-46, whatever you want to say. And there's, there's some controversy, and they do the rematch. I'm predicting that to happen right now, and I'm predicting me to cash my Cyril Garn plus 135 bet. So that's it, guys. The full breakdown. 30-minute breakdown on this one. You know, sometimes I give you breakdowns for fights. When I do the full card breakdowns and I take a minute. Sometimes uh, I take 30 minutes, but that's it. If you want a full card breakdown from me, I'm still deciding whether I want to do it or not. Um, you know, it does take a lot of time to do a full card breakdown. And I usually like to get them out a little bit earlier in the week, meaning I have to finish all tape a little bit earlier in the week. So, you know, if you do want to see that, let me know. Put it in a comment here if, you're, if you want to see my full card breakdown. And I'll take the comments on board. And if there is enough comments and enough likes on this video, um, I will do a full card breakdown for UFC 285 and give you all my picks, predictions and stuff like that. Um, but for now, that's going to be it. Again, We've been smashing it this year. We're already up 44 units with a 30% ROI this year. So it's looking like we're going to have an absolutely insane 2023. And I'm not stopping the tape study. I'm not stopping the work I've been putting in this year just yet. Right? I'm not stopping this train rolling. I'm very motivated this year and I'm going to keep on pushing it. So if you want all my picks and predictions and all my bets, if you want to jump on the money train, just go to lucrativemmabetting.com. Link is in the description. Um, it's extremely cheap for the service I offer and the amount of money we make. So if you want to do that, I'll see you in the members area. But till then, I'll see you in the next video. Good luck on all your bets.